Read it through one more time. Psalm 91 verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes thou shalt behold and see the reward of the wicked. Behold, oh sorry, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh to thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash their foot thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life will I satisfy him, and show him my salvation. Praise the Lord. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word once again and pray that as we go through this, the remainder of this psalm, that you will grant us wisdom and understanding. That your Holy Spirit bring alive the truth that is locked in this psalm and that it be a strength to each and every one who hears it. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at this psalm, haven't we? And the first, first study showed us that there is a very real and effective protection against the schemes and the attacks the actual attacks of the devil. There is a protection to be gained, a protection to be had, a protection to be enjoyed. However, this protection is available to all who who believe, but only active to those who dwell in the secret place. It's available to all, but it's only active and effective to those who dwell in the secret place. The second study showed us from what this the protection is effective. And although just how powerful this protection is to those who take the time and effort to dwell in that secret place. Let me repeat that. It showed us from what the protection is effective. We have protection, and then he tells us from what he protects us. Today we're going to look at the final ten verses of this psalm. We're going to close it all up today. And I hope that we'll see the wonder that is contained in this psalm. We have to remember the one who paid the price for us and that should remind us of just who and what this secret place is that we're studying in this psalm so I hope that you'll be blessed as we finish this psalm and I hope that you'll continue to read it and study it and see more and more of the wonder that's contained within it of our protection of our covering.
that we enjoy from dwelling in that secret place. But to continue, let's go on. Psalm 91 verse 7. We left off in verse 6 last time, but we begin today at Psalm 91 verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. That that phrase ten thousand is really a Hebrew word that really means a myriad. A myriad. It doesn't really matter how many. It's a quantity. A thousand will fall at your left hand and many more at your right hand. But this psalm is telling us something more important than numbers. It's telling us that this protection is for the individual. It's making it personal. A thousand shall fall at thy side. And ten thousand at thy right hand. It's personal. It's individual. And it doesn't matter what's happening to the thousands or millions maybe around you. God is speaking to you as an individual and saying that this protection is for you. Personally, individually. It's for those who take the time. The verse is clear. It's aimed at the individual and it's personal. God is intensely interested in your individual welfare. Did you know that? God has the hairs of your head numbered. He knows your very thoughts before you think them. God cares about you individually. He cares about us as a fellowship. Of course he does. But he cares about you individually. And you can take this psalm as a personal psalm of the protection that is promised to you if you'll draw near to him. It's personal. It's individual. And you know, salvation itself is a personal and individual thing, isn't it? Isn't it? Do you know, if you had been the only one in this world there was fallen in sin. Christ would have died for you. That's how much he cares. That's how much he cares. And you can take it personally. You can take it individually as a guarantee that he cares for you. And his protection is for you. And it's for us. But first and foremost, it's for you. And for me. Salvation is a work of God to the individual. You didn't come to Christ as a group. You came individually. And each and every one of you, each and every one of us, me included, have an individual testimony to tell. An individual testimony of how God entered your life. And took you out of the miry clay. And set you on a rock. Christ Jesus. That's God's individual work. To you and to me. Just as his protection, his covering. Is for you. Individually and personally. And for me. This firm affirms that. This protection is given to the individual who dwells in the secret place. You know, you can't hide in the multitude and be protected. It doesn't work. I know. I've tried it. It doesn't work. You can hide in a multitude of people who may be 100%, 110% committed to Christ Jesus and spend all long life long live lifelong hours in the secret place of the most high and they will be protected from the attacks and the wiles of the enemy but if you try and hide in that group as someone who doesn't abide in that place 
you will be attacked and you will be destroyed why because this covering this promise is to the individual first and foremost he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty first and foremost brothers and sisters it's individual before it is corporate we could try and hide but there's no shortcut in the kingdom there's no shortcut to this protection that is promised of the Lord because the protection is the Lord we are in him and to be protected we must remain in him abide in him in the secret place of the most high you can't hide in a multitude and expect to be protected because the devil's attacks and the wiles first and foremost are aimed at the individual before they are corporately yeah, once you put on that armour of God once you make that stand for Christ Jesus you become an enemy of Satan an enemy of the devil literally and who, those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution isn't that what scripture says but we have a promise we have a promise of covering we have a promise of protection a place that we can abide where the enemy cannot get to us cannot get to us and so verse 7 is telling us that this promise is personal the protection is promised to you individually regardless of what is going on around you whether a thousand fall at your left hand or a myriad ten thousand times ten thousand fall at your right hand if you abide in the secret place of the most high this protection is promised to you it's verse seven verse eight only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked one benefit of this position in Christ is that you will personally witness the judgment of the wicked turn with me to Psalm 36 well, verse 34 Psalm 37 verse 34 says this wait on the Lord and keep his way does that sound like abiding in the secret place sounds like it to me wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land the meek shall inherit the earth isn't that what the New Testament says the meek not the weak he shall exalt thee to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off thou shall see it you will see the judgment of the wicked you know there's a prophetic pattern to this just as a, an aside here there's a prophetic pattern in, in the word of God about this uh, seeing the judgment of the wicked you know when the Israelites came out of Egypt they witnessed the destruction of the firstborn of Egypt they saw it with their own eyes and when they did come out what happened when they crossed the Red Sea they witnessed the destruction of the enemy before them or well, behind them actually but they witnessed it they saw God's judgment upon the enemy and it will be so in that last day you will see the righteous judgment of God and a wicked world 
Psalm 91, verse 9. Because you have made the Lord your refuge. Let's read that again. Made, made singular because thou hast made the Lord which is my refuge even the most high thy habitation because you have made the Lord that word Lord there is Yahweh Yahweh because you have made Yahweh almighty God your refuge the word refuge is Makase Makase and it's a shelter a trust, a place of refuge. Even the Most High, we read this before, Elion, Elion, the Most High God, because you have made him your habitation. That word habitation is ma'on, an abode of God, a home, a tabernacle, a temple. Sp scripture tells us, doesn't it, that know ye not your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He abides in us and we are to abide in him. Because you personally, individually, have made Yahweh your abide, your abode, your shelter, your tabernacle. And this means that because you through repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ have developed this relationship with God through him in the secret place. You're now in Christ. You're now in Christ Jesus. Is that right? Hallelujah. Smile, you're in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Turn with me to Colossians 3, verse 3. Colossians 3, verse 3. Colossians 3, verse 3. Just to encourage you, for you are dead. Hello, dead. <laughs> you are dead. And your life is hid where? In Christ, with God. Your life is hid in Christ, with God. Sorry, with Christ in God. Is that an encouragement? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. Just a little back. Ephesians 2 and verse 6. Let's start at verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy. Do you agree that God is rich in mercy? Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Two scriptures to prove where you sit. You know your body is sitting here today your spirit is in Christ with God that's your security that's your secret place so why don't we dwell in that secret place our life is in with Christ in God what an amazing promise that is. And if we dwell there, who can touch us? Who can bring us down? Who can discourage us? If we dwell in Christ with God. But it isn't, is it? Time work, demands, family, work, all kinds of things draw on our time. But will any of those things keep us out of hell? No. 
The only thing that will keep us out of hell is Christ. And the only thing that will protect us from the things of the world and in the world is abiding in Christ. And this verse, this verse 9, means that because you individually, personally, through repentance and faith in Christ, have developed this relationship with God through him in the secret place. You are now hidden with him in God. Because you dwell in that secret place. And I trust each and every one of you dwell in that sacred place. You have a time, you have a place that you go to daily to read his word, to come before him, to hear the Holy Spirit, to prepare you for the day. Because at the end of the day, that's exactly what this psalm is talking about. It's developing a relationship with God. Verse 10. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Those two verses go together, 9 and 10. Let's read them together. Because you, let's put you there when it says thou. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation, no evil. Neither shall any plague come nigh to thy dwelling. What's your dwelling? This is your dwelling. This body. This mixture of enzymes, and water and minerals. This is your dwelling, isn't it? Yeah, we dwell in the world. But this is your dwelling place. You are inside here. And because you have made God your refuge, no evil shall befall you. If our lives are hidden with Christ, in Christ, sorry, with God, then no destroying plague. We read that word before, do you remember? When it talks about um, the plague. Where are we? No plague shall come nigh to thy dwelling. No destroying plague, no evil can befall it because he is our dwelling. If we're secure in him, trusting in him, abiding in him and with him, listening with our ears in tune to what the Holy Spirit is saying through his word and in our time of prayer with him, which should be one of the most precious things on this earth, our time with him, if we are doing that, no evil can befall you. How do we know? Because God has promised it. He has set his name, his word above his name. Did you know that? He sealed this word with his name. This is his promise to you individually, personally. And he will not, he cannot go back on his word. There is no darkness. His promises are yea and amen to those who believe. So those two verses go together. Because you have made him your refuge, your shelter, your covering, no evil will befall you. You can't can't verse 11 excuse me while I have a sip verse 11 for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways does that sound familiar turn with me to Matthew chapter 4 Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. 
Let's start at verse 5. Matthew chapter 4 verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city. This is the temptation, the seduction if you like, of Jesus by the devil, Satan himself. The Holy Spirit, remember, led Jesus into the wilderness for this testing. The Holy Spirit led him there that he might overcome. Just as we have to overcome in our lives. Verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. Those who have been to Jerusalem have probably seen the pinnacle. It's the point where the western wall, the so used to be called the Wailing Wall, meets the uh, eastern wall and it's the highest point of the platform can't remember how high it is but it's pretty high and there would have been colonnades on top of that the devil took him there and said unto him if thou be the son of God cast thyself down for it is written he shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash their foot thy foot against a stone do you notice there that it's a personal attack an individual attack Jesus on his own just as we are and he'll come and he'll test and he'll try to deceive and, dis and uh, seduce but the devil there uses those exact words from Psalm 91 it's the promise. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And he goes on. They shall bear thee up in their hands lest thou dash their foot, thy foot against the stone. There's an important thing I, I'd like us to, to understand, maybe learn for those who uh, are young in the Lord. When Jesus walked this earth the first time, when he came to pay the price that we've just celebrated here today, to go to the cross, to pay that debt for us, he did so as a man. Yes, he was God. He is God. But he paid the price as a man. And that's important to understand. Why is it important to understand? Well, if Jesus didn't pay the price as a man, our salvation means nothing. Because we are men and women. Jesus had, Scripture says, he emptied himself of all that was God. He just emptied himself, literally. But he set aside his divinity. He determined not to use his divine power while he was here on earth. Not once did Jesus ever use his divine power. I defy anybody to show me a place where he ever did. All the miracles that were done through Jesus were done through him by the Holy Spirit in submission to God the Father. If he'd have used his divine power, our salvation would be void. It'd be meaningless. And that's exactly what the devil was trying to tempt him into doing. To use his divine power so that he could destroy the sacrifice. To make the sacrifice null and void. To make it unclean. Because then Satan would be able to say, Aha! You used your divine power. And then there wouldn't have been any point going to the cross. Because his sacrifice would have been meaningless. He went, he suffered as a man. He submitted to God his Father. That's why when you read that he spent night after night after night on the mountains in prayer alone. He was dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Communing with God the Father. Drawing strength from the Holy Spirit. 
And every single miracle that was accomplished through him was done through him by the Holy Spirit, not by his divine power. And that's why he's high and lifted up. Because he did it as a man. He now has his divinity once again. And he will use it. Oh boy, will he use it. And you will see it. Fortunately, you won't be on the receiving end. Many will. But he determined not to use any of his his divine power, but to allow the Holy Spirit to work through him as with any born again believer. Why do you think Jesus was able to say, greater things than these shall you do, because I go to the Father? He wasn't saying, greater miracles than these you'll do. What greater miracle is there than raising somebody from the dead? Giving someone their sight. But he meant more of these things you will do. Because he was only here for three years in his ministry. Three or three and a half years. Whichever way you want to look. But that same power that moved through Jesus is available to you. And to me. Individually. If we would only dwell in the secret place. And draw near to him. Submit to him. And allow the Holy Spirit room to move through us. You know, the work of Satan in Matthew 4, verse 6 there, was to try and tempt him, seduce him, deceive Jesus into using his divine power. I've already said that. but Thus making any chance of salvation through him void. Thank God. Jesus prevailed. Thank God he overcame temptation. And how did he do it? He did it through the word of God. And faith in God his Father. And that's exactly the same way that we overcome. Now then, in saying all that, I want to make clear that this does not mean that we can go out into the world and put ourselves into situations where we will be in danger presumptuously. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't mean that I can just walk in, let's say, into a mosque and start abusing them for being heathens which they are, by the way. And telling them they need to repent and be born again of the Spirit of God through Christ Jesus. I doubt if I come out alive or at least unhospitalised. But that would be just stupid unless God told me to. And then it would have to be done in love. Not in anger. There's an example. I want to tell you a a little story, a little account. Just to... um, So that you can more easily understand. An easier example. In the 3rd century, there was a, a young boy who then would be about 16 or 17 years old, whose name was Oregon. Oregon. Those who have done some study will probably recognise that name. And he would become, later in life, a theologian. Whatever you think about his writings, that's of no importance today. But his mother and father were believers. And his father was martyred under the reign of Septimus Severus, 
Roman Emperor. And Oregon, being a young, impetuous lad, loved his father, loved the Lord, really looked up to his father, and he determined in his mind that he was going to follow his father to martyrdom, to the glory of God. And he determined to rush down to the city, to those who had killed his father, and proclaim the Lord he was prevented from doing that by a loving and wise mother who hid all his clothes why was that wise? because he went on to be one of the great early fathers of the Christian faith countering false doctrine and setting Doctoring as it came to be known in the word that we have today. He did some wrong things, yes. But many good things. But you see, all that would have been lost, wouldn't it? If he'd have gone impetuously to follow his father, seeking martyrdom. We don't seek martyrdom. Nobody wants to die. Do you want to die? I don't want to die. But that's different to finding yourself in a situation where you come into danger accidentally or by the working of the enemy let's say or by the working of the Lord David Wilkerson gangs in New York back in the 1970s God protected him and many were saved through that but God had sent him That's the difference. It's having the ear to hear what the Spirit is saying, isn't it? Before we go. We don't go in our own understanding. We don't go with our own ideas. We don't go in our own thinking and our own way. We hear the word of the Lord and if he tells us to go, we go. But if we go under his instruction, we have his protection. Is everybody clear on that? Praise the Lord. I hope that little analogy helped. We don't seek martyrdom, but if it comes in God's working of things, then God receives the glory and we are drawn to Him. But we don't seek it, we listen for His leading. Psalm 91, verse 13. Getting back to our psalm. How are we doing for time? Time goes so quickly, doesn't it? Almost at the end. Verse 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under feet. You know the devil, Satan, Lucifer, he has various names, In scripture is called various things. And here are three. You can jot these scriptures down if you have a mind to. If not, you can hear them again if you listen to this message online or whatever. But first, name is a roaring lion. It's called a roaring lion. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, He roars, he roaring devour. Like, like a roaring lion. There's only one roaring lion. That's the lion of Judah. And we know who that is. Jesus. He will come soon as a roaring lion. But the devil is known as like a roaring lion. Secondly, that old serpent. Revelation 12 verse 9 and Revelation 20 verse 2 call him that old serpent serpent and thirdly the dragon it's found in Isaiah 27 verse 1 the dragon but also in Revelation 12 verse 3 and Revelation 20 verse 2 again serpent and the dragon he's doing well 
But his name is called by various things. And although there are many enemies seen throughout scripture, many enemies, Malachites, Hittites, lots of otherites, various kings, various forces, behind it all there is only one single character. And that's the devil. Whatever name he's called, behind all the enemies in the Old Testament, behind all the enemies and uh, evil forces that come against us, seen in the New Testament, there is one character behind it all. It's the devil. And this spiritual war has been waged since the very beginning, since way back in Genesis 3 verse 15, where the promise was given. The curse was handed down to the serpent and Satan through the serpent. That he would bruise the woman's, the heel of the woman's seed, but his head would be crushed. That promise will be finished by God through his son. I want you to turn to Romans 16, if you will. Romans 16 and verse 20. Romans 16, verse 20. Once in context, let's, let's begin at verse 18. 16, verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience is come abroad to all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly the God of uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you Amen the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly Amen we like scriptures where it talks about the bruising or the crushing of Satan's head don't we you know the word there for bruise is shuf, shuf, bless you. And in Genesis 3.15, it means to crush, to break the serpent's head. It's to remove its power and danger. And I want you to understand something here. That it's an interesting fact. All the poison, I'm talking about a venomous serpent now, which Satan is. All the poison snake contained in its head, not in its body, is contained in sacs in its head. And if the head of a serpent is crushed, the danger is over. That speaks volumes, doesn't it? The serpent's head is going to be crushed. And any poison that could come forth from that head can't. Jesus crushed the serpent's head at Calvary for all those who would repent and be called by his name. That's something you can take personally and individually. Stick it on a pin and put it in your lapel. Jesus crushed the serpent's head at Calvary for you. So his poison cannot affect you. If you are in him. That's what it means. What a great victory that is. Doesn't that make you want to rejoice? Hallelujah. I'm glad somebody does. Praise God. The serpent's head has been crushed for all who believe. 
and abide in Christ. He might try to come against you. He might try to deceive you. But in Christ you have all the armour that you need against him. All the armour. All the protection. He is your refuge. He is your strong tower. And as we come into these last few verses, 14 to 16, I'm taking them all as one piece here. Because he has set his love his love therefore I will deliver him I will set him on high God speaking about you he will set you on high I will be with him you in trouble I will deliver him you and honour him you with long life you can't get any longer than eternal amen amen And that's what you are promised. Eternal life in Christ Jesus. With long life will I satisfy him. Will you be satisfied with eternal life in Christ Jesus? Come on saints. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. With long life will I satisfy him. And show him or you my salvation. That day is coming brothers and sisters. Where you will be with him eternally. Not in this weak body, but a body like his. Eternal in the heavens. Glorious. Wonderful. Dwelling with the saints. Dwelling with Jesus. Hallelujah. What a glorious promise. These final verses all speak of one person. Jesus. Jesus. And that is, of course... Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus because he is now in heaven, seated next to the Father. Christ Jesus is the heavenly picture of Jesus. Jesus Christ is the earthly picture. That person is Jesus. The whole psalm is an exaltation of him. It's an exaltation of him who died for us. Who is now become our dwelling place. The holy of holies. In him. And along with him comes that shalom. Do you remember right at the beginning. The first message in this series. I called it the shalom of God revealed. Well that's it brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ is our peace. He is our shalom. Because everything you will ever need in this life and the next you will find in him or from him and this whole psalm is an exaltation of him the peace and security that one has when one dwells in the holy of holies the secret place of the most high God El Elyon the most high our abiding in him is the only place of safety not here at the barn not anywhere else only in him is our place of safety found the only place of safety in a world that's swiftly, quickly moving towards a day where everything that can be shaken will be shaken and ultimately that this world will be judged in righteousness by El Elyon himself and finally to the day when Satan himself even Satan himself that serpent the dragon whatever you want to call him until that day where he is finally consigned to his place of punishment for all eternity and so To tie it all together, to conclude this. I know it's been a a long message. But in this three-part study, Psalm 91, we've seen, I hope we've seen, the heart of Almighty God towards you. Personally, individually. 
and to all who would trust in his provision through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. All the provision, protection, of which we have read in this psalm, since the cross, and in and through Christ, he is our refuge. He is our refuge. Since the cross, Christ alone is our refuge. And he's the only place where we find the shalom of God. That holistic wellness, let's say. I just made up a new word. <laughs> holistic wellness. Well, two words, really. But he is our refuge. He is our dwelling place. He is our secret place. He is our secret place. And you know, the punchline, if you will, of this psalm came right at the very beginning. He who dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The remainder of the psalm teaches us from what we are protected and by whom and in whom we are protected. That's what I hope you've seen in this psalm. It's a glorious promise. No one knows who wrote this psalm, brothers and sisters. But God wrote it just for you. But you know, the question is, as it always is, do you believe it? In your heart, do you believe it? Is it real to you? It is real, saints. It is real. But is it real to you? Would you put your life against it? Oh, every day. The Apostle Paul was wise enough to teach all his converts, all his disciples, that they must have the full armour of God. They must have the full armour of God to be able to stand, let alone withstand the wiles and attacks of the devil. If you don't know where that is, it's in Ephesians 6. Put on the full armour of God that you may be able to stand. Let alone withstand. God is once again sending out a warning to his people. A loving warning. An urgent warning. A yearning for people who believe in him to draw near to him. Why? So that they'll be protected from what is to come. It doesn't warn us about the wiles of the enemy, about the fiery darts of the enemy, for nothing. Paul was no idiot. He knew persecution. He knew of the fiery darts that the enemy could throw at him. But he trusted God to bring him through and God brought him through all of them to fulfil his work. But God is once again sending out a warning to his people to be ready, to be prepared for what is to come. To be prepared with the full protection that comes with the shalom of God in the secret place of the Most High. Because war is not coming, brothers and sisters. War is here. God bless you. Let's stand, shall we? Heavenly Father, we, we're so grateful that you love us so much that you increasingly, constantly, perpetually warn your people to draw near to you, to come under that shelter of your wing, to come into that secret place of the Most High, to be in 
that relationship with you in which we can all trust. I pray, Heavenly Father, that in this day and the days to come that you will burn in our hearts your word, that you will not let us rest until we are as close as we can possibly get to you in that secret place. For we know in that place, Lord, we can trust we have shelter. We have protection. And we have all the power of heaven about us. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And I pray and ask your blessing on this, your people, this day and in the days to come. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Send joy fellowship, brothers and sisters.